Back fuel, baby. Hi, we back. Back fuel, back fuel, back fuel. Atlanta edition. Mm. I'm ESSO. Everyone sees sounds of fish on with my partner in crime. The Heineken. Yeah. And we got a special guest today. Super, super legendary DJ, Greg Street. Just a regular guy. Yeah, whatever, whatever street. What's whatever. a legend? A legend is I somebody. I thought the Acura made the legend. A legend is somebody who has made a difference in this culture, a notable difference and ongoing over a course of years. That would be you, right? I don't know. We're going to say the architect. <laughs> That's one. You, but you don't like that word, legend? I think. To make you feel old? No. No. Active legend is the word. No, I just, I don't really rock with the labels like that. Okay. You know, it's like, if your work speaks for itself, you know, people going to say what they going to say. But, you know, some people may say you're a legend. Some people may say he ain't shit. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm mm. saying? I, I mean, what 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 is this? What is the sound? What it's is so crazy now? You know, with the internet yeah. and social media, is so crazy. It's like, did you, you didn't see all the memes they made about Tom Brady after they lost the game. Nah, I ain't see. <laughs> they what, what made the googly it? eyes and all the crazy stuff they was doing. Mm, nah, like, I ain't see. Man, I got what? Eight rings, seven, seven rings, rings, seven yeah. rings. Like, so they don't care about okay, that. Hey. that. But that don't mean nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I'm ducking. Yeah, seven I'm ducking. Rings. But I mean, yo, but 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 the hip hop scene out here, you've seen it transform to every stage that it's been. Oh yeah, from from Texas to Georgia, you know what I'm saying? Um for me, how I kind of created my lane, um, it's a real passion for me. Mm-hmm. As a kid, started DJ at 16, 17, DJing parties, DJing clubs. And I'm from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. So it wasn't no industry. It was just the people. It was just about the people. And okay. then when I, I went to Mobile, Alabama in 1988 to start doing six to 10, that was my first six to 10 job. So it was just the people. I started meeting like, you start meeting like record reps and stuff like that because, you know. You want to stay they saying you're, they doing, come a, you're doing a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. and. You know, you just genuinely like music. Like, I'll just pick up a record because I heard it and start playing it. Like, for example, um, records like Daisy Dukes. Mm, okay. Records like, I was the, I was the even before New York, I was the first DJ to play Dance Effects. Oh, wow. Okay. I was the first DJ to play Call Me D Nice. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I got a, I, I, I don't even have a tape, but Leaders of the New School came to my show in Dallas and freestyle for 45 minutes. Mm. Red Man came to my show in freestyle. That's why I, back in uh, 94, 95, you heard Red Man say, uh, underground technique, piece to Greg Street. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's because we had, a, I met him, you know, when he was doing his thing. So for me, for a lot of years, I wasn't attached to no industry. Wow, okay. I just, I just DJ for- You just two, liked music. I just liked music and I just DJ every weekend Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, every weekend for like 10, 15 years with no days off and worked at the radio station. <laughs> yo, I saw, yo I, when I first got in this game, I told him I never took a vacation for seven years. Yeah. I was in the studio every day. But you know day. why, though? Because your job is a vacation. I said that too. Your we job, went, it's it's like when, you, when you're doing something you love to do, mm-hmm. it's like it's not a job. A career and a job is totally different. It's like mm. you're not, I'm DJing. I would go to my man's record store, my OG's record store, JJ's Record Mart, and I would, because I DJed in so many cities around my hometown, he would pay me like $1,000 back then. This was 85, 86. He would pay me $1,000 to come in the record store and make a tape. Because when I'm making the tape live in the store, customers are coming in, DJs Buying coming in, DJs are coming in, want to buy the 12 inches, but customers are coming in, they waiting to buy the tape. Mm. And then I would sell them on the road, he would sell them in the store. I wouldn't sell them at home, but he would sell them, you know, at, at, in, in the hometown. I would sell mine on the road. When was I that would, was that was that good um, marketing for you? Was that it was marketing great mar- promo? It was for great you? marketing. Yeah. Did, did you get gigs from just DJing inside the record store? Yeah. Because because that. Back then, that's where everything broke. Every every rapper wanted to go to the 
pop and record store. Yep. Every every DJ wanted to go to the pop and record store. People from all over the state came to this record store because JJ, mm. who owned JJ's record mart, he was like a real cultural person. That's why I said what made his 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 because, different. Like this is this is the store where David Banner probably sold his first music at. And David Banner's from Jackson. He's 90 miles from Hattiesburg. But JJ was like just he was our OG. He was our homeboy. He was mm. our big brother. He was our friend. And mm -hmm. he was our mentor. So he taught us everything from promotions to marketing and just if you really love to do something, how to make it work. How did you get from Mississippi to Bama to Atlanta? My mother's from Alabama. So long story short, when I was in Mississippi in high school, a guy from Chicago moved to Hattiesburg because he had an auntie that lived in Hattiesburg. He was from Chicago. Mm -hmm. His name was Tony Brown. Mm -hmm. Tony Brown. Tony Brown, I know that name. Not that Tony Brown. Oh, okay, okay. Tony Brown worked at the radio station with me when I was in high school. He had just graduated from college, but he didn't stay at the station long. He went and got a job as a PD in North mm, Carolina. Wow, okay. And then he got a job as a PD of 93 BLX in Mobile, which is a big station in the South. It's a 100,000 mm. watt station on the coast that you can hear from Louisiana to Destin, Florida. Damn. So bro. like all the offshore workers, like people would call me on the radio from the offshore rigs. People would call me from Mississippi. People would call me from North, uh, past like Evergreen, Atmore, all over Alabama. So all you was DJing all, so with that, you was DJing all, all bro, over Bama. Bro, because of what I did in Mississippi, uh -huh. when I, once I got the BLX, like BLX and Mobile, JMI and Jackson, YLD and WAIL in New Orleans were like the biggest stations in the South in that little area. So it was like, once I got the BLX, and BLX, well, New Orleans was bigger, but BLX was bigger than Jackson mm -hmm. and bigger than Meridian. And I knew okay. people that worked at Meridian. I went to the radio station to visit Andre Russell, Guy Black. I knew people that worked at the radio station in Jackson, mm -hmm. Paul Todd and um, Heavy Herb and all those guys. And I was watching them doing what they was doing. And um, I was just learning. So you was a young one. I was young. I was just watching them. I didn't even know them. most of them. I was just watching them and paying attention. Then one of my OGs from Mississippi, he was a radio guy by the name of Rob Neal. He actually worked at um, he worked at Triple X, which was a pop station in our hometown. And he worked at Country K and Z, which was a, a a country station in College, Mississippi. So I, I moved around with him. Then he got a job doing overnights at Well 105. So he actually took me to the station one night. And Barry Richards was the program director. And now I'm cool with Barry. And he had Barry Richards would broadcast live. Barry Richards and Slick Leo would broadcast live from the famous on, on the radio on Friday nights. And we would listen from 90 miles away. So it was like, so I saved my money. I was so intrigued by Slick Leo. I saved my money, bro. And I paid him to come to my hometown to DJ a party. Word. Just so I could meet him. Meet him. Mm. Oh, I got you. I got you. So after all these years go by, after all these years go by, and I start doing my thing in radio, getting in the major market, and I became, um, over the past five or six years, I became Facebook friends with Barry Richards. Like, like this guy was like Barry Richards, Jay Stevens, uh, Steve Smith. Like, Barry was like the foundation of what, Hot 97 was in New York. Mm. Like Barry Richards was the brains behind that in New Orleans. He had a station called Well 105, the station with the juice. And they was going crazy with on the, the radio. Hip -hop, with the hip hop? Yeah. Going mm. crazy. Crazy on the radio. Mm -hmm. So then after him came um, Jay Stevens and, and Steve Smith and all those guys, all the white guys that was programmed. But Barry, to me, from my point of view, was like the, from where I could see, and then Dallas, you had Michael Spears at K104, which I eventually worked there, but Michael wasn't there anymore. You, you were using way. Dallas too? Yeah. I did I did Dallas and Atlanta for three years while I flew back and forth every week from 2002 to 2005. But I worked in I worked in I worked in Mobile from 88 to 90, doing six to ten. Then I went to Houston, the Magic 102. You did Houston too? Yeah, I went to Houston. We did all the rap a lot stuff. I brought Mel Smith to rap a lot. You bought Mel Smith. I to brought rap Mel to rap line. Line. Yeah, Mel was working at Jive. He was the mix show rep at Jive. We had never seen each other because you know, I think I'm telling you, I'm not, I wasn't an industry guy. But I met him on the phone and he would send me music and blah, blah, blah. It wasn't nothing about no money and nothing. He was a cool dude. So when I moved to Houston, he came to Houston because Too Short had a concert 
1990 at the Aragon Ballroom in Fifth Ward. Mel came to Houston. We went to the show. Lil J had told me what he was trying to do with rap a lot. This was before my mind playing tricks came out when he had did the deal with Geffen with um with Rick Rubin and they had mm-hmm. the they, they put out the uh the album that had the big sample with the rock and roll record, yeah, the Gangsta Love. Uh-huh, mm-hmm. And then after that, Lil J was like, me and Lil J became real tight. And he was like, Street man, I know you know all the radio people. I'm trying to find me a radio guy. I really want to make my label big. So I introduced Jay to Mel at the Two Short concert. So Mel was like, you know, man, I work for Jive. I ain't coming to no rap a lot. So Jay was like, Lil J was like, how much you make? He told him, I'm going to just make, I'll double your salary if you come work for me. <laughs> <laughs> but the crazy part about the story is this, though. Mel didn't even like the Ghetto Boys. Wow. Mel liked E. Remember original E and OG style? I know how to play them. I know how to catch them slipping. Mel liked E because E reminded Mel of a down south LL Cool J. And LL mm. Cool J was like the man yeah. in 1990. Uh-huh. So um, long story short, I got Mel to come. Mel came to rap a lot. They built the whole brand. Um, you know, we brought he brought MTV to town. Dave Mays was just starting the Source magazine. Got Dave Gale, was gonna film at the mall. Yeah, mm-hmm. he, he's out here shooting all kind of stuff. He got uh, the uh, trash with a uh, with the uh, trash can joint. No, he got the one with with, with Bubba Dub. Oh, he did trash it? talk. Yeah, it's, it's new. That's okay. And he had the um, mm-hmm. then he has the um, cornbread TV. But um, um yes, yeah. you do with a uh, funny Marco. Oh, yeah, he's with that shit too. Yeah, Dave is producing all that. He getting that bag. Bro. Dave is going yeah, crazy. Man. He's going. Dave, crazy. I need a deal, Dave. <laughs> the Greg Street Show is on the way. Damn, nah, man. but um, it's just it's a lot of history, bro. Like, and then um, to go to work at Magic One Hundred Two, I went to Magic One Hundred Two in Houston. You got to think like a lot of legendary people been through this station, and before I went to Magic One Hundred Two in nineteen ninety, um. That's when I changed my name to Greg Street before that. I'm about to ask, yeah. when, when did you change it? I'm about it, to it, ask it was 19, Greg Street was born in 1990. What was your original name? It was it was Gregory KP. But there was a guy at the station named R.P. Cola. So the, 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 the general manager, he wasn't the general manager at the time. He was like the consultant slash general manager because he had retired. A guy by the name of Monty Lane. He came up with the idea, but it was like all the, um, you had a lot of DJs calling themselves MC. Remember back in that, yeah. like they was naming mm-hmm. themselves after like you had MC Jammer and MC and all these different people. Yeah, so he somewhere. wanted to call me MC Greg Street. I was like, I'm, but I'm not a rapper, so <laughs> I want to be Greg Street. So for a while we we did it as MC Greg Street, and then we switched it all the way to Greg yeah, Street. But what was the KP stand for? My my middle initial and last name. Oh, okay. All right, all right. But it was like you know he came up with it. I always give him the credit. He's still living too. He lives in West Palm Beach, Florida. I think his son is the general manager. Of the radio station out there. What was the idea behind Street? Because, because Tony, to get back to that story, mm-hmm. see Tony Brown, the guy who was telling you about who went to Carolina, he came to BLX, and he brought Skip Cheatham first, and then he brought me. Oh, I, I, I know Skip. Yeah, I met Skip. So Skip, Skip came, and Skip was the music director. I came, and then they transferred, the, transformed the whole station mm-hmm. from the five-hour shifts to the four-hour shifts instead of ten to three. Three to set, three to six, three to seven, seven to midnight, uh, midnight to six. They changed it to the six to the six to ten, ten to two, two to six, six to ten. So the quiet storm then came on at ten. So I came on at six. This was nineteen eighty eight, mm-hmm. and um, Tony Brown was the program director. So we were there for a while. Then Tony got a job to be the PD in Atlanta. But what happened? It was like two general managers at V one hundred three. So one guy wanted Mike Roberts, who was the morning man at the time, to be the PD, and the other guy wanted Tony Brown to be the PD. So they hired both of them, but Mike was already here. He was the morning man. So they made both of them like the program director, and Tony came to Atlanta. And then I stayed in Houston for a while, then I went to Dallas. And then um, Tony was like, when they started, V-103 had like a strong monopoly in Atlanta. It was like really the only station. So they had, I think they had competition on the upper end with, with, with Kiss. Kiss 104 had came, which was a signal coming, I think, out of Athens or it was like one of them states. A signal? Like what does the, that mean? Yeah, the towers. The towers. I know, yeah, I know. I was just yeah, so they moved. The they, so they moved. It was, I think it was licensed for Athens, but they mm. moved it closer to Atlanta so you could, it was like making like an Atlanta See, station. Okay. Mm. So they were doing pretty good, but like the V103 was about to get attacked from the hip hop side by, it was hot, it was, um, 
Hot 97.5 at the time. Then they changed the, they moved their frequency to 107.9. So they brought me in from Houston. Tony said, I got the perfect guy to, to make this happen, to, 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 to be able to keep the 2554 numbers, had the 1834 numbers, and the kids. He knows mm -hmm. how to do it. So they brought me in. And um, it was all, for years, it was like Greg Street compete on V13 competes against this whole radio station. Mm. So, um, you know, we, number one, all demos for, for years and years and years. When did you become the industry guy? Because you kept saying, I wasn't the industry guy. I wasn't the, when, okay. when did it shift? Because okay. you are an industry guy. <laughs> I, had, I, had never, I had never been to, I had never been to Jack the Rapper. Shit. I had never been mm. to um, any of the conventions. I went to BRE, I think, one time. Okay. I never been to any convention, so they was having a how can how can I be down or some how can I be mix, down mix mm. show power or something some in my in Miami, mm. and I wanted to go, and um, my boss told me I couldn't be off that day. I had waited too late to put in the day off. I couldn't do it, so I was pissed. So that Saturday, I'm at home cleaning up, working, messing around. This was uh, probably ninety, um, probably ninety. 99, I'm at home cleaning up, messing around, and um, my phone rang, and it was Mike Karen. Oh, wow, Mike Karen. Mike Karen was 18. From Atlantic. Mike Karen was 18 years old. He had just got the job to be the A&R. Really? I was the first person he signed. Before Trey Song, before Na Nappy Roots, before any other artist, I was the first person he signed. He called me. He said, man, I was, I was talking to a good friend of yours, Tony Draper, at Suave mm. House, and he was like, I was telling him that I wanted to do it. I had did my research on you and I wanted to do a deal with you. So I was like, cool. And that's when I started understanding how life worked. Like sometimes you don't get what you want because something else may be waiting for you. So what else did you want before? Oh, how can I be down? Yeah, I wanted to go to the my convention. My bad, my bad, I got you. <laughs> but like even before okay. that, when I was in Houston, I knew Master P. I knew Tony Draper, I knew J Lil J from Rap A Lot, but I wasn't an industry guy. These were just my boys. Master mm. P came to me when nobody knew who he was. And I played his record on the radio because I, threw, I knew he was dope. And I told him at that time, I'm like, bro, if you ever get some production, you're going to be out of here. Because mm. he was doing the jacking for beats. His record was called Jack of the Jackers, where he had sampled a bunch of records like Ice Cube did on okay, Jacking for Beats. Jacking for Beats. He had made a Jacking for Beats type of record, but it's called Jack of the Jackers. And I actually played. I still had a CD to this day. This was 1990, 1991. Before God, about it, about it, before all that. Be before about it, about it. Way man. before that. So like, but you know, he was living in Val he was living in California. So he had a he had a deal with City Hall, which was the same distri distribution company that distributed E 40s label. In ninety one. Yeah. He had no limit and all that, but he was rapping more about California, and he wasn't rapping as much about. Louisiana. I've never heard this shit about mm. Master P ever. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, he was in. He was out in. With, with, I think. Uh, for his uncle King George, who ran the company, who was setting up the labels for the mm -hmm. independent artists, because every region had one of those distributors. Like they had City Hall in the Bay, that Selecto hits in Memphis, Atlanta had Itchy Bun, um, Houston had Southwest Wholesale. Mm -hmm. All these different cities had these different independent distributors that was putting all this music out. That's why you heard artists from those regions that was breaking out. Because they had the distribution. They had the there. distribution for mm. that specific but if, region. But if I own a distribution company, I live in this region, I really know what's going on in this city. And if I can push this. I got record. people that's running around telling me, my kids is telling me, people telling me in the office. This is the like, record. This, this is the record. This Distribute is the record. this record. You need to get this record. Right. So that's how those records were going going crazy. Niggas got rich then. Yeah. Motherfuckers got rich that were distributing those fucking records. Yeah, because they was owning the masters. They mm. was they was robbing they got, everybody. They got mm. filthy rich. They was robbing everybody, but that's how Lil J, J Prince, that's mm. how Lil J and Tony Draper and Easy E and people uh, like that was in the game had peeped the game and started learning the game for themselves in their city and started putting records out themselves and getting them eighty twenty deals because you you know what I'm saying eighty twenty is crazy you ain't getting that no more how does one go about becoming well, they still giving them out yeah they do I mean you got bad money. bunny got a ninety ten I mean Who? Bad, 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 bad bunny. bunny though but did he, he get it before but he did the deal when he was nothing. 
How the fuck you got 90, 10? He Bro, must have some money. Because it was, just, it was just like, I'm putting my music up on the platform and they get 10% just yeah. to distribute. I'm That's just it. a new artist. Uh, yes. Like how you just you go know who put I did that? I tried to do that deal for? Handsome Baller. Oh, no, we was going to set him up, have Fab do the remix to one of his songs. And you know, in New York, a lot of the times, independent artists. They don't understand the game. They think they're always getting robbed because, you know, you hear the game, contracts are bad, contracts are bad, contracts are bad. And he was just, he didn't, he didn't trust us or he didn't think it was a good situation. Well, most young people that's trying to get into music, they don't know nothing about the music business. No. They just know how to make a record. That's and it. They, and, and they want to say they got screwed, but if you didn't learn how to read when you was in this 8th, ninth, 10th grade, it's not our fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's not our fault. You can, you, you if, if you know everything on World Star, everything in the shade room, and you don't know what's going on in your paperwork, there's something wrong. But you with know you. what's going on with with Young Thug in court. You know what Lil Dirt got going on. You know but you what, what Lil Baby doing. It's, it's provo- I, I feel like like how you've lived your lifestyle as a DJ. It transcends even the South because even from being from New York and not having the knowledge of the South, I knew who you were. I, we niggas know who Great Street is. <laughs> and they knew, yeah. Yeah. That is you flex and clue. Like your name is there, and for a city where. Everybody's to themselves, and we're so obnoxious and arrogant about it. Niggas know Greg Street. So if we're talking from New York across to Arizona and everything in between. Well, I'm going to tell you why, though. I'm going to tell you why. I'm mm. going to tell you why. Because I've always been real with guys, and it's mm. never been about money. I mean, mm. you can go from, from LL Cool J to Kid Capri. Like, Fly Ty's my man. Mm. That owns Cold Chillin'. Mm-hmm. That's my man. When I, was, when I went to Houston, Fly Tie, he wanted to promote the label. He brought everybody to my college party. College night at the venue. Yeah. He, brought, he brought Kane. He brought Biz. He brought um, Shan. He brought Granddaddy IU. He brought everybody on the label mm. to this party. Mm. Same thing with Wu-Tang. When they came out, they brought everybody to I remember Wu-Tang was on tour. They had their own mic packs because there was so many people in their group. It was back in the day when you go to the club and they only got one shitty microphone. So, so Wu-Tang was the group that had, they was in a van. They had their own mic pack with enough mics for everybody. And all they had to do was just have one, one ox plug or one input for them to come in and plug into your board and control all those mics from one, from one pot because they could control them from their, from their, nice. from their mic pack. Yeah. But like Naughty by Nature. I had Greg Street versions of Hip Hop Array when mm. the song first came out. You know what I'm saying? Um, but was that because it wasn't a lot of down south hip hop that was pumping? It was a lot of East Coast hip hip hop? No, what, what people don't understand about down south is if you was a real DJ and you were really into music, we played everything. Like when I went in the club, I played everything. I had a set with the New York hip hop, I had a set with the Miami Booty Shake. Mm-hmm. I had a set, you know, uh, Cool C was popping in Philly. Mm-hmm. Cool C, yeah. Cool C. The glamorous I got life. a habit. I got a habit. habit. <laughs> All that. So it's like you had sets mm-hmm. where you knew, you know what I'm saying? Because we didn't really have artists at the time. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, That's why I asked. Yeah. You know, reggae, hip hop, R&B, White crossover records like mm-hmm. ABC and the Eurythmics mm-hmm. and all those records. That was all part of the playlist. It was back all then. part. Of, it was all, was all part pop of pop culture. Yeah. So it's like mm-hmm. Madonna. A lot of people don't know that Madonna mm, was a part of the playlist. I would check this Yo. out. A lot of people don't know when Madonna first came out, she was a black artist. Madonna was like Mariah Carey. Yeah, she was. She she came out. She was on the same label, Cy Warner Brothers, with Ice T. And uh, Jermaine Dupri had a group called Silk Time Leather. My mother loved Madonna when she first came out. The That's first single, it was on. everybody. It was yeah, a song called man, everybody. She loved Madonna, bro. Because she was a black artist. When Madonna first came out, she was our artist, and that's why she always fucked with black black dudes. If if you if you watch, <laughs> like she always got black dudes around her. How how does somebody become a PD? Like if I if I wanted to become a PD right now from this media, would that be possible? Um, <laughs> PD from media. this meeting, mm. no. Mm. But it's just being a program director of a radio station is really just about. Understanding formatics, understanding the clock. What's a formatic? The formatics of how the music works. Like music is designed to, like people listen to radio and they be like, oh, they play the same songs over and over again. These people ain't stupid. 
Because you got to think, when you go to the rec- when you used to go to the record store, you didn't walk in the record store and say, hey, give me all the new albums. You went in the record store and bought something that you had heard about, something that was anticipated. Mm-hmm. So the radio station does the same thing. You play the music that you know people want to hear. And the average person doesn't listen to the radio that much. But I'm going to ask you this question. Think about this. You're in the car with your girl. You're 21 years old. You're 18. And a song, you jamming. Just say, Eric B and Rock Kim is on. Or Big Daddy Kane is on. Or Lil Baby is on. Mm-hmm. And a song comes on that you never heard before. What's, what's she going to do? She's going to be like, what is that? And she might turn the station. She's going to push the button. Let's see. So that's the, that's the science. It's not science. It's common sense. That if you plan a song, it could be a big song six months from now, but today it don't mean shit. So how do you make it mean shit? Once it once it come up through the once it start buzzing and people start talking about it. Too short went on the radio when he came out, but everybody all over the all over the country knew. Hey, maybe hear about this guy named Too Short. How did that happen though? Because shit? of people. people, word of mouth, you think? Word of mouth promotions. You know what I'm saying? Social media really is people re-interacting, people kicking it, and people understanding. Like, the whole thing with the computer is just the new version of it. But social media has always been people just interacting, being social. Mm-hmm. How do you uh, break Saha? Saha twins? Saha, interesting story. Saha, um, mm-hmm. he was signed to Boo. He was signed to Akon's brother. Mm-hmm. And a guy named Mike, Mike Davis, with CKP. And neither one of them would spend no money on him. They would spend no money. I'm like, bro, this dude is like, y'all got y'all a Jay-Z. Y'all got a Kanye. Y'all got a, a dude that could be big. Mm. But you know, they would never spend no money on him to, to get it where it needed to go. So didn't Al Branch have something to do with Saha the past too? He, he, he helped with management later, later, later on. on. Okay, but later, when okay. I got with him, I was like, bro, you could be big, bro. So I started spending money on them just because I liked them, just to show them like wow. what could happen. Like the video being at the top of the World Star, the video getting shot, I paid for it. The video being at the top of World Star, I hit Q I up, remember that. sent the money, yeah. I remember that whole the play, intro. the big box, yeah. everybody wanted. Yeah. Guess it, what? You know, when you saw him, when you saw him floating down the street, yes. I'm pulling him on the dolly. <laughs> I'm pulling him on the me. I'm on the set pulling him on the dolly. And I'm paying Decatur Dan to yeah. shoot the video. Decatur Dan, that was an, he wasn't into the internet at that time. So yeah. that big box on World Star was like being on the biggest television radio station on the gotcha. internet. That jacket that yeah. looks like the, the Michael Jackson jacket yeah. that he wanted. I pay for that. Because it would be a big <laughs> box and then little boxes and then the rest, it trickles down. Yeah, and then, yeah the big yeah. box at the top, yeah. that's where you got all the views at. So why were you paying for it? Because it don't seem like you were trying to get something I, I didn't have it. no paperwork. I didn't have nothing. I, was just, I just liked him. I, you I just knew. I knew he was something. So you just liked him and you spent that money, money, money on somebody that you liked and didn't know where you were going to get your money back from? Because it's like... I'm just curious, you, because niggas in New York not doing that. No, nah, not at all. I'm, I'm just curious because you, because you like he signed to somebody else. Mm-hmm. I like him. I'm gonna spend money and help him. I don't got no paperwork. I just want to see you win, bro. bro. So I just want to see him win. I, I, it, it got so serious to where like he didn't have anywhere to stay. Me and my partner, we got him an apartment. He was like, but I need a wash and dryer so I can wash my clothes. I like. Bro, just throw all your underwear and socks and shit away. I'm gonna just buy you enough shit where you ain't even gotta wash no clothes. <laughs> just throw it away. It's real He'll shit. He'll tell you this story. I said, I, I've been Yoke Street ever since you came <laughs> into my life in this way. You've been completely solid. Mm-hmm. Never lying. I ain't got to ask him nothing. I know your shit is a hundred. I'm just sitting up here shocked. Like, I've never heard this story. I never heard people do things of this nature and not have paperwork or try to find a way to make their money to just say, I believe in what you're doing. It's the same way that you did with me. Bro, listen. Yeah, you reached out to me. Bro, you didn't have to. Young Thug was managed by a guy named Bobby. Mm-hmm. Real cool guy. He worked at Walters. But Thug was like, I knew Thug from Crucial. Thug went, and from South Atlanta High School. Thug came to me. He's like, bro, I need you to be my manager. I'm like, bro, but I'm cool with Bobby. I can't, you know what I'm saying? But he was like, bro, I'm out here doing shows. We making money, making a little money. He won't reinvest no money into me. I need to get my teeth fixed. Boop, 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 boop. Mm-hmm. He won't spend no bread. So I said, look, Thug, listen. This is how much I rock with you. 
Dr. Jeffrey Brown, the dentist, he was like my favorite dentist. You go to him, you got a problem. No pain. I got my wisdom tooth pulled at 9.30 in the morning and went to work at 6 o'clock. That's unheard of. I never filled my prescription for my pain medicine. Never. So I told Thug, I said, listen, Thug, this is my dentist. Go to him. Whatever it costs, I'll pay for it. Wow. And if the if shit turn out the way you where it turn out, you know, one day you can pay my money back. If not, hey, cool. He went, I think he went to one or two appointments and never went back. But I'm just that type of dude. Like my mama, my mom taught me like how blessings work. Like you don't help somebody and then hold your hand out behind you. Like you expecting mm. something, you, you're expecting to get something from it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You, you do it because you want to do and, it. And a lot of people, a lot of people had that mindset going in, like, if I do this, I'ma get blessed. I know I'ma get blessed. I, yo, I'm gonna, I, I, do this. Yeah. Greg, Just do it. Greg, I'm gonna be honest. I'm I'm not gonna cap. I used to think like that, and I used to do a lot for people, right? But I always be like, yo, I guess I'm gonna get blessed back. And then I met my wife, I gotta give her credit. I met my wife 11 years ago. And she said, Randy, you do so much for everybody, but you're supposed to just do it because you want to. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you want to, so why are you looking to get something back? With your ability to give the people is the gift. Yeah, it's a, it's a blessing to be a blessing. And I, and it's I, two sides of the blessing. Mm. I didn't see that until 11 years ago. And I was like, now my giving is different. I, I, now. I used to think like that. And then somebody gave the example of, are you being a good person because you want to go to heaven? Or are you being a good person because you believe in the word? And that's when I said, the same thing with the blessing. You giving it because you, you. I was being a good person because I wanted to go to he heaven. And I had go. to, when, when I was younger, like, there were so many yeah. things that, and I, I even you. ventured off the side of the road. I sold drugs. I but you was going to go to hell for some of the other shit you did. <laughs> <laughs> you got to deal with that he, other shit. He talking too much right now. Man, he listen. Too much. <laughs> I want to I ask you something, because you said, um, I saw I'd asked them, um, there wasn't enough down south artists. When did you start feeling, ooh, we have enough artists to really impact? Man, I'm gonna tell y'all some, bro, I got so many stories. Come on, I want all of them. I'm gonna tell you, some, I'm gonna tell you something crazy, right? Yeah. But like we said, Mel worked at rap a lot. Mm -hmm. So when Biggie comes out, when Biggie comes out, <laughs> Puffy wanted Scarface on the remix to Big Papa. Cause you gotta think, you gotta think now, in 1992, 93, 94, Scarface is the biggest rapper yeah. in the world. Okay. Yeah. Like Jay Z is Scarface's Scarface. biggest yeah, fan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bro, so they wanted, Puffy wanted Scarface on the remix to Big Papa. And it was like, we want a big bag and we want points on the album. Cause you gotta think, nothing was out but Big Papa. He didn't have a, he, the, out, the project wasn't out. Mm. So nobody knew that Biggie was gonna be really this dope. Cause it was only Flavor Year for Craig Mack. Biggie had, Mac, mm -hmm. and, and, and party and, and bullshit. And Craig Mack took off before Biggie. Yeah, he, mm -hmm. he, he, he went I, crazy. I, I, he went crazy. He went crazy. So <laughs> when Scarface, like he's one of my favorite rappers of all time. I think, if not number one, definitely top three. Mm -hmm. So when Scarface came, Ghetto Boys, and then after that, during that same time, you gotta think. Luke had his camp going. Poison Clan, Luan Love, um, and Quit, Luke, mm -hmm. Two Live Crew. And a lot of people don't know that po that first Poison Clan album, them boys was going crazy. Mm -hmm. That album was stupid. I'm not familiar with it. I'm going to have to go back and check it. You got to go listen to it. Mm -hmm. J JT Money and Uzi was going Money. crazy. So That's once you had, fun. then you had Home Team, he had Home Team, mm -hmm. he had Pick It Up, Pick It Up. Mm -hmm. So. And then you had a few other people, like a lot of people don't know, Manny Fresh was um, Gregory D's DJ. Who's Gregory D? Is a, rap, Gregory, a rapper? Rap, Gregory D was a rapper from New Orleans. Okay. And Manny Fresh was his DJ. Mm. So you had Gregory D and DJ Manny Fresh, and then you had the, then you had the artist star coming out of Memphis. Um, Selecto Hits had the DJ Jimmy. And then you had, um, New Orleans had Bust Down. Bust Down, Adventure Star, Sign the Loop. You had to put your ballys on, pop mm -hmm. that thing, mm -hmm. um, nasty bitch, mm -hmm. a few other records. So when you when, when we start getting all those artists, now you got 
five or six or seven artists from the South that you could play their music. Then right after that, you know, 93, 92, 93, 92, UGK came along. Mm -hmm. So now you got UGK, they had this amazing album that was only on cassette with all these classic records on it, Pocket Full of Stones. Pocket Full mm -hmm. of Stones. Front, back, side to side. Mm -hmm. You had all these, the policemen are your friend. You had mm -hmm. all these records, Too Hard to Swallow. Um, and then they just start, they just, they just start coming. Mm -hmm. Texas went crazy. Then of course Georgia had the booty shake music. You had Raheem the Dream, mm -hmm. Kilo, mm -hmm. MC Shadi. Mm -hmm. Shadi, I know yeah. MC Shadi. Shadi's really from New York. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But he was like the New York rapper from Atlanta who was like Run DMC. Mm -hmm. But he was making the booty shake music because he had came to Atlanta. So after, you had D Rock, uh, Success in Effect with the Roll It Up My Nigga, Roll It Up My mm -hmm. Homeboy. So it just started. It started bubbling, and things just started happening, and music just started coming out. And then now you got a whole crate of down south records. What did LaFace mean to Georgia? Oh, a whole lot. L.A. Reid was. I like, was talking to him about. about yeah, I, I can remember Jermaine telling me a story because Chris Cross had came out and blew up when when L.A. Reid and them moved here. And um, where they moved here from? I thought L.A. Reid was really from Atlanta. He's not. Uh, L.A.'s from Cincinnati. They they from Cincinnati. But they had moved to LA. They was living in LA. And um, I did a, I, I was starting a podcast called Business of the Talent. In my first episode, I interviewed LA. And he talked about when they was in Cincinnati and Babyface wasn't a part of the group and how he got in the group. And then when they blew up and they moved to LA and they had a bad deal and they moved to Georgia. They said, we're going to pack up and move to Georgia and start this label. And um, one of the first meetings they had, Jermaine had told me this story before I even did the podcast for LA. He said, um, I went up, Babyface in L.A. called me in for a meeting. So I go to the meeting, and uh, we having a meeting. Then L.A. steps out to take a call or something. And then Babyface told me, hey, you know, you know, it's, 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 real, it's, it's real dope. I'm real proud of you, what you did with Criss Cross. But, you know, uh, that really ain't shit. You know, you really ain't nothing in this business until you do it again. L.A. said that to Jermaine? Babyface said it to oh, oh, him. <laughs> wow. Like, you, you really ain't shit in this game. And that's when he was like, it kind of came in his head, like, I got to get more groups. I got to make more records. Mm. Jermaine was telling me, like, TLC was his group because he was dealing with Criss Cross. He gave TLC to L.A. and Dallas now. But um, L.A., if you go watch the podcast, you could really tell what L.A., what, what how, how the whole shit came about with L.A. Reid, LaFace, and Atlanta. He's like, he had an artist, remember Damian Dame? Yes. He's, with the <laughs> hair and all that shit. L.A. said he had he, Damien Dame. He thought Damien Dame was just the dopest artist ever. And um, wasn't it a girl and a guy? He, he went to he went. It was a guy, I think. I thought Damien Dame was, was a girl. Get by. I don't know. I he got went you. to he went to a meet with Clive Davis. I think in New York. Goes to a meet with Clive Davis in New York, and he's on Clive like you know. I got my new label. You my distributor. I got this artist. When you gonna push the button? Like when you gonna push the button? He's like, what you mean you push the button? So I say, watch this. I want you to watch this next artist that comes on stage. And the MC said, ladies and gentlemen, Whitney Houston. Whitney Houston kills the showcase, right? And Clive Davis looks at L.A. Reid and says, is Damien Dame yet? <laughs> <laughs> L.A. said, L.A. said, wow. He said, I got back on the plane, came back to Atlanta. In the next six weeks, he said in the next week, six weeks after being at that showcase mm -hmm. with, with, with Clive Davis, he signed TLC, Outkast, Usher, mm. and um, Tony Braxton within six weeks. Was Pebbles there already too? Because he had Pebbles, right? Yeah, him and Pebbles was cool. Mm, yeah. So Pebbles had TLC. Um, they knew it was two of the girls that was in the group. One of them wasn't in the group. I'm trying to remember which one it was. Was it Chili and Left Eye or Chili and T-Boss? One of them went in the group, and they put the other one in the group. And then um, somebody told them about Outkast. Mm -hmm. They came in to audition. L.A. was like, uh, uh, uh. Then they yeah, came, I heard he really didn't feel them at yeah, first. Then he came back again, and whoever the guy, I can't remember who the person was that was pushing them. They like, okay, we're going to go ahead and do the deal. And then um, somebody was with Usher. They brought Usher in, and he said... The Braxtons came and audition. It was Tamar, I mean, um, the whole group. Tony and the group. And he said after they auditioned, everybody just sitting around vibing, and Tony was on the piano. 
playing and just improvise, just singing. On, they church, on her church shit. At the singing. Time. And baby, LA said him and Babyface looked at each other like. That's the one. That's the one. Mm. <laughs> but he tells the whole story on the podcast. It's, on, it's up on YouTube and some different platforms. Mm-hmm. What did it mean to the South when that iconic moment, between, you know, when at the Source Awards where it was Snoop and East Coast, West Coast, and Outkast came and said, the South got, got something to say. And that gets overlooked, but I, I, I always felt you like- You think so? You, you think oh, it's overlooked? Yeah. Okay. On, on a larger scale. It, it, it was overlooked for a long time. Yeah, but really? now it's- Oh, yeah. now it's known now. Yeah. yeah I think. But, but this, is, this is what you really got to pay attention to. Like, this is what you really got to pay mm-hmm. attention to and understand how God works. Because mm-hmm. you got to think, Andre was probably 18 years old when he said that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They just, they done made players ball. They done made ain't no thing. They done made get up and get out. They done made get up and get out. But are you thinking that these two guys are going to push the envelope on every album and become the biggest hip hop group of all times on crossover music? With crossover music and rap. Like he said this when they was making. So then play a list. Yeah. Cadillac, Which was different from music. everything else that you had heard. Mm-hmm. It was different. It was different from Scarface. It was different from Rap a Lot. Mm-hmm. It was different from Uncle Luke. It was different from uh DJ Jimmy and all the stuff you had heard. Kilo and Raheem and uh all the different records that came out. It was totally different from Bust Down mm-hmm. and the stuff that came out of New Orleans. Yeah. So it was like, and then every album to think they pushed the envelope every all album. The time. With a with a cre- new creative sound or a new something new creative that they was coming up with, but this all stemmed from the this guy gets on the mic at the so- Source Awards and says the South got something to say. And if you remember when they came out, so you was rocking with Clue. If you remember the the, the episode when Clue was on the show with Lala, Director Fact. Yeah, they mm-hmm. did. A, they did. A, I don't know if it was Direct Effect. Or yeah, right. DFX, Direct Effect. Like, direct Effect. Like 2003. Yeah, Direct Effect. Mm-hmm. So when the album came out, when the double album came out, and Clue asked him, like, whose ingenious idea was this to do this double album? And Big Boy was like, Greg Street. Greg Street came up with the whole idea. Mm. And the reason why I came up with the whole idea was because I knew that if they put out solo albums, the industry would tear them apart because they're going to compare them against each other. Big Boy sold more records than Dre, or Dre sold more records than Big Boy. Yeah. And if you remember how the album took off, Dre's side of the album didn't take off first. Big Boy took off with that way, with the way he moved. Yo, yes. I, I like the way. Yeah, Big Boy should have gone faster, and then yeah. and then Dre came back with that punky thing. Yeah, 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 uh, uh, with the hey y'all, hey, hey y'all. Uh, uh, people, if you remember when the album first came out, people was taking returning the album to the store. They were saying they didn't like it. Mm, yeah. I remember that. But but the and whole that's thing, a diamond now. Niggas was disappointed. In, in New York because Big Boy, because Big Boy snuck up on niggas. niggas let, let me tell you something about it. paying attention to Big Boy like that. In when that record came out, we was. I, I was. This is a question I was going to ask you, but it, you segue into it. To me, T.I., Outkast in that moment, and Little John is what ushered Atlanta and the South to take over from 03 till now. With, with, um, well, well, hold on, hold on, yeah. hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Master P had a big influence. He came out with the whole thing, putting out all them albums every week. I on but, but in the what, movies. No, the but, but that was the that was the the seed. What I'm talking about that shift. Cause I was in 02 when 50 was putting out the mixtapes and everything. When I moved down south in 03 and Little John was pumping, I was like, this is about to go off. And I'm gonna tell you something crazy. Yeah, you gotta think. Lil John was. He was a- working that album for a while. But he was the A and R for So So. For So So Def at the time. He was the A and R for So So Def. Yeah. And, and Jermaine was so big. Mm. Jermaine was so big. He big. He wasn't really paying attention to Lil John like that. Y'all forgot Lil John when he did a deal with Too Short. Yeah. I didn't realize that. I John know. did a deal with Too Short, and uh, Too Short took Lil John to Jive, and they didn't get it. They didn't get it. So um. Was it because TBT? John, because John had did a deal with Carlos Glover and yeah. Ichiban. Yeah. Too short, put up the money to buy John's name back, get him out of his deal, did all that, took him to Jive, and Jive said, uh, I don't know about that. 
Short Dog was in Atlanta a lot. Like mm-hmm. he was living here. Yeah, Short Dog was like he was living here. When I got to Atlanta, Short was already he was here. already here. He had been living here before I got here in ninety five. Short was a pit when I came down here. Short, was, I was like, what the? Oh, fuck? His mom, how? his mom, Wayne Lope, they were short, Shorty B. They was all living out here. I didn't know. I was like, how? When I first came out here, I was like, how the fuck is Too Short so known and big? out This motherfucker, I didn't mm-hmm. realize that he he had lived, he lived down here. here. Yeah, like, he lived here. Lived. Here. He was huge. Because I, I remember that wave. Because it was like yeah, little John, little John, little John was little John was a sleeper. Yeah. But Lil John was so seasoned because a lot of people don't know Lil John and a guy named Paul Lewis, they had a reggae show on V103 on Friday nights. Mm-hmm. They came on like 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. So Lil John had been DJing and he had worked at So So Deaf. He came up with the idea for the whole crunk movement, which was really, mm-hmm. the crunk music really started from Memphis. 3 Six Mafia and them really crunked that shit up. 3 Six Mafia. Um, but was was tear the club up, crunk? Tear the club yeah, up, yeah. Crunk. Okay. yeah, hell yeah. So what you got think? The, was that the original crunk that, record? But, yeah, no, no. But check this out though. Tear, the original version of tear the club up was like a dark three six mafia song. It wasn't crunk. DJ Herb, who was my producer mm. on my show, made the remix version that started the crunk movement, mm. and I started it on the radio, and we started at the gate. In, 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 Dec- in Decatur on Columbia Drive, and that's where the whole thing came from. Like, okay. if you go to listen to the original version of Taylor Club Up, it don't sound nothing like what you what it sound mm. like that you know. And we made that remix. Herb made that remix. I mean, that's why that. I mean, how if if you're doing all, all, all of this stuff and, and and have done it, how could we not call you legendary? You didn't been in Dallas. Houston, Mississippi, Alabama. Alabama, Atlanta. You didn't did records. You didn't found niggas. You didn't gave niggas ideas on how to sell the Outkast double album. That is like and, and that and, album and, 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 changed. And that's nothing. The, like we yeah. can't even talk about everything that you've done. But just in this short amount of time, everything that you did is legendary. Niggas ain't doing the, that, bro. Th- that's why I said with Little John. That double album and how T.I., the reason why, even though I was living south, a lot of up north girls was digging him because he has family up there. Those were the three artists I said, yo, they're shifting this. Oh, yeah. And from since I remember that, it clear as day, from 03 till now, it's been. Well, see, because I knew the street music, if y'all remember, they put mm-hmm. they put the wrong single out on T.I., they put out the record with Beanie Man. Yeah, yeah, Beanie yeah. Man. And Beanie Kate Man, Slay was behind that. Beanie, yep. Beanie Man is my guy, mm. but he put the record out with Beanie Man, and Ti was a trap. He was a he was making yeah, the trap music. Yeah. So I was the only DJ playing Dope Boys in the trap. Interesting. And, and Ti would tell you that was that's what really cultivated trap trap, trap music, music. Me getting behind Dope Boys mm. in the trap because everybody everybody because KP found um, Ti yeah. right. Yeah, but, but that I, record was out years. That came out mm. in like two thousand. Yeah, so when, it, was, it was on the first album. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It was so on the first. I like Ti. I, I, I like Ti from his first album, although it didn't sell. I actually like the Beanie Man record. A Me too, bit, but that's because we're from New York. I know that, but and I then K Slay helped now. walk that record in. He was but, instrumental in breaking oh yeah. him up there. But, but I understand but that Dope Boys in the Trap. That was the one. But you that know, was the record. Well, I always say Tomb is one of my favorite producers. Tomb, Tomb. Tomb yeah. yeah. That's my guy. I fuck with Tomb. Yeah. So Tomb that twenty fours, I mean, drop top shit. Uh, Tomb is dope. But see, y'all, what? Was, y'all forgot though. Tomb was producing them Shadi records. Mm. See, I didn't know. See, Tomb was DJ. Adam, when I came Tomb, down here Tomb with Smack, Tomb was Shadi's DJ. When I came down here with Smack, I didn't even know everything Tomb had done. Stop. Okay, so I was yes. just in, in the studio with Tomb. And he was laying out everything that he had done, and we bonded because I was managing Rockwilds at the time, and that mm. was two, two producer niggas. And that's how, and I didn't know, like, coming from where we just coming from, I didn't know what Toomp did. I didn't know what Toomp brought mm. to the Atlanta scene. And Toomp is a humble guy. Like, mm-hmm. my, God, my God brother, Sea Dog in Dallas, and me, we call Toomp. Dr. Dre of the South. Yes, I agree. I totally, I totally agree. agree. We've been calling him that for years. Years. I, I totally. I've always but, said he's one of my favorite. But I, but I told him, I, t- I actually had to tell him because I met him when he first graduated from high school when I first mm-hmm. went to Dallas in 92. I told him, I said, but what you don't understand about Toomp, Toomp was Shadi's DJ and producer back in the day. Toomp was on tour with Shadi when I worked at BLX in 88. 
Mm-hmm. So y'all know each other way back then. Because we did the summer gym. But, and I was so intrigued by Toot because I pay attention. Like I saw you on the podcast. Toot was the first DJ, left-handed DJ I saw the DJ with both turntables on one side. They little <laughs> shit like that. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Because you know I'm into the car world. And I remember when Envy said, why can't me, Greg Street, and Flex do a car show together? You can, Envy. I, I want to see it. We could do it. We might do it this year. I got some in the works, so we might do it this year. Because, because you know, that car world is so I love beautiful. Flex. Yeah. I love Envy. We're going we gonna, to we gonna figure this out. I think you the bridge to make, make it happen, we, we man. Gonna fi- we're going to figure it out. Because everybody talk about it say, well, Flex ain't going to do it with Envy and blah, blah, blah. blah. Man, do it Flex, and I, do, it. do it for do the culture it. And, and, and street. When you have your joint, I just want to host one or two of we'll the parties because that party Fle- is Flex, party's we'll go crazy. do it in Dubai and, and, and stream it because I want, I want one of them Devile 16s they got over in Dubai. <laughs> you seen that shit? No, I ain't seen Yo, it. You ain't seen that car? No. What? It's got a jet engine with like four turbos on it. Mm-hmm. The car's like 5,000 horsepower. You know, in I think Drake I got one, that. but I've been on them way before Drake had it. Yeah, in Dubai, you know, there's like an abandoned lot with nothing but Ferraris and high-end cars. No, bro, them Ferraris, them no, no, listen to this. Y'all can throw that shit in the trash. Yo, that Deval 16 that's made in Dubai, bro, it's got a jet engine in it. But I'm telling you, it might be in an abandoned lot because it's an offensive crime if you can't pay your car note. Like, it's really a big crime. So dudes just be like, I can't pay it. And they just leave it on the side of the road. He ain't got one of them on the side, bro. That shit, trust me. They, yo, I'll so show you the documentary. It's nothing but like Bugattis and shit. They just leave them. Because if you can't pay it, you're jammed up. They'll lock you up for real, for mm. real. That's why I'm like, yo, Greg, we could probably scoop up a couple of Bugattis, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's going to have some dirt in there, but hey. fuck it. If you, car get, show. if you get locked up in Dubai, you're never trust me, home. I know a few people who've been <laughs> locked up in Dubai. Dallas Austin was like, you going to have some problems. Oh, man. And how you going to get the car back if you don't have the paperwork? Hey. Big business talk, man. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You will go to jail and you will not collect $200. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a, no monop- a no-nopoly game. Not monopoly, no-nopoly. So let me ask you a question, Sri, because mm-hmm. I'm not going to keep you here all night. Yeah. All the shit that you're doing, what's next? Is anything next? Are you just like, I'm in my, I'm in 20, my pattern? What's 30, up? 23, uh, Sneaker Friends is back. Mm-hmm. I saw the, um, today I saw it on the news, they was talking about Ticketmaster and Live Nation. And that's kind of the, one of the reasons why I have been doing it since like 15 I did a partnership with uh, the Atlanta Hawks and State Farm Arena mm-hmm. when it was Phillips Arena. And that's where we did the last one. I brought Just Blaze came down to DJ. Jason Jeter was there. Um, um, Diamond D came. Okay. Clark Kent, of course, mayor. All my sneaker friend partners came. But it's like, I got a real problem with how these venues are being ran and people don't really understand the game. It's like, if you put on a show, and you break your show all the way down from insurance to promotions to um, EMTs to the workers in the building to everything you got to do to make the show happen, promotions and marketing. If you break all that down and then break down your ticket sales and break down your revenue, somebody like Ticketmaster making more money off of you just from service fees on yeah, the ticket. Oh, yeah. It's Turn like, it okay, down. so I got to pay the building. Then I got to give the building a percentage mm. of what I make. And then y'all, oh, y'all put service the, y'all put the, service, the fee, service fee on my ticket. So I'm like, I got to find an independent building to be able to do it. Because I just it, it, it just doesn't make sense for me to put up all this money and I got to give all this money away. But this is the Chocolate City. Everybody owns shit out here. Y'all ain't, you, you don't got a building, nigga, to put your shit in out here? It's about the, the convenience of the customer buying the ticket. Yeah. yeah. That's where they get you. The convenience of the yeah, customer. Yeah, because it's easy to buy the ticket. It's easy yeah. to find the ticket. It's easy to download so guess what the that ticket. Mean, guess what, it's in their phone. So guess so. what that means then? But, as, like, as black Americans. But, but, but the, I'm telling you, yeah. a lawsuit just came down. Mm. They got a lawsuit about to come up about because it's a monopoly. Because, there you go. Because um, iHeart owns 
Not with Clear Channel, who does all the concerts, they own Ticketmaster. Mm. But they got it up under another Clear parent. Clear Channel own Ticketmaster. They got it up under another parent company. <laughs> they got up under another parent company name, but everybody know what's really going on. And now they've disclosed the information based off of what happened with this Tyler. The mom, what's her girl name? Mm. Taylor Swift. Them Taylor Swift fans, you know, it's the whole ticket thing. Yeah, the thousand, all them expensive ass mm. tickets for yeah, her so shit. everything has been exposed now. Wow. Now it's, it's about to be some changes. Maybe that's going to help us. Yeah, think about it too. That's how Nike, you ever seen that um thing, how Nike avoids paying taxes? No. Uh, they got Nike split into two companies and one's registered in one area. I'm, I'm fucking it up. And one's registered in another. And where, where one's registered at, they don't pay taxes in the Cayman Islands. Mm. So the other one pays the money for whatever the paperwork and they just avoid taxes altogether. They're washing it basically. Yep. Legally. I mean technically yeah. not legally but legally. Yeah. That's I'm, I'm gonna send you I'm gonna send you our both they the video. They figured it out. Yeah. They figured it out. So all them Jordans And we still in the meeting. Yeah. So <laughs> yes. Greg Street man. <laughs> Yo Greg. Greg. I we still in the meeting. <laughs> they done figured it out. <laughs> I appreciate you coming back. I appreciate you Waiting around when I didn't even see you see, sitting. Yeah, there. he was right there, man. And um, because you were definitely one of the highlight, the highlight of me coming down here. Absolutely, was the first thing I wanted to do. I said, "Y'all wanted to have make sure I have Greg Street on on what's, this show." What's your favorite current record to spin right now? Because I'm gonna tell you my favorite record out right now. Favorite record out right now? Yeah, right now. He I'm knows. Not, I know what your favorite record is. Right now, favorite record. Who put it? I know this this South dude too. I'm I gonna think. tell you his favorite record street. Ready? Yeah. He liked that big boogie. Oh yeah, big boogie. Big boogie yeah. lives in the A too. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. He lives out here. Um my favorite record out right now. Pop out, big boogie. Oh yeah, big boogie. Yeah. Going that's, crazy. Yeah. That record been out for a minute too. Yeah. My favorite song out right now. That you enjoy spending right now. Current new joint, or you know. Um it's not really new, but my favorite song out right now that I listen to, I like Future Married to the Game. Gotcha. Mm. More yeah, money, more problems. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, bad more food. guns, more violence. <laughs> Comment, like, subscribe, <laughs> super thanks, share. Lil Baby. All the Lil Baby songs. <laughs> <laughs> something to prove. We in Atlanta. Y'all don't even know. I'm gonna change I'm gonna tell you something crazy. All you Lil Baby fans out there. A lot of people who are bandwagon Lil Baby fans don't even know this. Lil Baby's biggest song has never been a radio song. I might be one of the only DJs that ever played it on the radio. What song? Freestyle is his biggest song. I've to heard, this date. I've heard that. Out of all the records he done put out, Something to Prove, uh, In a Minute, uh, the song with Kurt Franklin, all your favorite Lil Baby songs that you riding to, Freestyle is the biggest song. Go to YouTube and look how many views it has. Bang. The biggest song. That's a lesson for you. Maybe you don't need the radio play like I say you do. <laughs> people with Greg Street, big song. Everybody don't. Play. Everybody don't. Some people are special. <laughs> Some people fans gonna find it where they gonna find it. Some people are special, man. I, I, that's true. All I've learned so far since we've been in the A, everybody we sat down with has made a mark to the point that every convo needs a part two. Yeah. Part two, fact. part three, part four. Part two, part three, part four. Envy Flex, we coming. Mayor, um, Mayor Clark. Oh yeah, we coming. Dubai, Dubai, Dubai. We may be coming. Sne uh, sneaker car show. No, nah, I'm not gonna do that. You know, yeah, no, 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 okay. No. They was doing. Flex did that one time. That was kind of monkey. Oh, I remember that. It was kind of to do the cars with the sneakers. It was kind of. It was kind of like Can't do too that. much. Mm -hmm. It's too much. It's too much. Yeah. A lot of people have tried to do it. Like uh, KO ATF, he had some cars at the um, at his show that he had re a few months ago. But I would, I would, I would, I, I would nah. never mix the car, car show. Was, car no show in Dubai. You know what I'm saying? No sneaker and car show together. A mechanic, One or the other. a mechanic or a person that paints cars, they're gonna fuck the shoes up. It's gonna be <laughs> grease all on them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you see, he got them classics on his feet right now. Absolutely. He stayed, oh, yeah. he stayed with some fresh Kanye, garden. Yeezy, where are you, Yeezy? Hey, Adidas, y'all need Ye back, too. I, they, I, they, they I, I'm on Y'all on the email list. I see all them 60% off and 70% off sales on, on Adidas.com. Y'all know y'all need Ye back. 
You think Nike should bring back Kanye? I think Adidas should bring him back. My whole thing with all that is, I'm, I, I, I was explaining this to one of my club brothers. I ride bikes. Mm -hmm. I ride Harleys. I was explaining to one of my club brothers, like, like we got to stop falling out with people and saying, just throwing them to the side. It's like, mm. I'm not an asshole because I don't think like you. You're not an asshole because you don't think like me. And we got to start fixing some, These young kids that out here, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old with guns, killing each other, how can you be mad at them when we doing the same shit? They learn. They, Show's over. They learn it from the best. Show's you. over. <laughs> Show's over. <laughs>